Shall we start? Um, so thank you everyone. Who...
what are the inequality constraints we need to take into account in, this, uh, in our uh, mathematical optimization problem. So that would be the GIX. Uh, you can see um, it's, an in, it's form as inequality. Uh, we have this uh, less than equal to zero. And then also uh, probably we need to include some equality constraints in the system uh, in, in the optimization problem. So this is represented as H A G X. Uh, so we need to formulate our physical system into this sort of uh, form. Um, so uh, in order to be able to uh, think how we, in order to identify what sort of parameters or what sort of par variables, what sort of constraints that we need to include in the system, we need to also identify how a power system look like. So this is just a, what I'm showing is a simple power system. So there are five, uh, four different components considered here. First is the bus. So you can see this is a representative of a bus of, of, or, or a node and a generator, a branch. This can be an overhead line. This can be a, a cable. This can be a transformer and lastly load. And uh, in the past couple of years, there are a lot of uh, different components model uh, or developed in order to be included in, the, in, in in power systems. So for example, there's a lot of studies on um, storage uh, inclusion in optimal powerful problem. There's a lot of also in, uh, inclusion of, uh, for example, renewable energy generation there. But for this uh, tutorial, we, just, we will just consider uh, this component, these four components. So we have again bus, uh, generator, branch, and load. So going to the optimal power flow problem. So what we need, what we first need to do is to define uh, our uh, mathematical optimization problem of, of, of this uh, physical um, system. So in order to make it more general, we need to define the, the set, some sets of the system first. So uh, to make it more formal, so for example, bus, uh, we, we can define M as a set of bus, uh, G as a set of generator, B as a set of branch, and D as a set of load um, in the system. And also one important thing that we need to consider is that we need to identify how the connections uh, in the system look like. So we need also to identify what I call as R. So that R means that um, it's a set of BIG in R. In A, A is a set of R. So BIG means that B, B is a branch that connects bus I and bus G. And, uh, there, there could be also multiple branches connecting two different buses IG. So we need to define uh, this arc as well. And after defining the set, now we can uh, start thinking of uh, what variables we need to consider in our optimization problem. So variables will be, these variables will be the decision uh, in our application problem, this is what we want to obtain in the end. Uh, what we want to know uh, how much uh, the values would be, and 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 ultimately uh, uh, this would be included also uh, in the constraint and also in the um, objective function in our problem. So if you take a look at the at this variable, so going from each component, so for example, bus can think of different variables that can be measured, that can be controlled perhaps uh, from uh, each bus, uh, such as voltage magnitude, uh, I denote it as UM, uh, and then also voltage angle, I denote it as uh, delta M. So from, from this one node system, uh, try to represent what, what these variables are. And for generator, we can think of, for example, like, how much active power we need to inject and how much reactive power we need to inject um, for the branches. Um, we need also to calculate or have variables to represent how much the active power and 
the power uh, flowing through each branch. So this will be a starting point uh, of our of formulating our optimization problem. Do you have any questions? Or something is not clear? All right. So now we have sets, we have the variables. Uh, it's a good start for uh, formulating our optimization problem. I also need, I want to uh, note that, so in this case, uh, the load in the system is assumed to be an elastic. So there will be a set of parameters in the problem. So PD or QD, which represent um, active power and resting power of a load, respectively, uh, won't be treated as a variable. So they they both will be uh, parameters which are uh, unchangeable in this case. And um, after defining the sets and also the variables, we need also to include some constraints, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so these constraints come from limitations or physical attributes from each component. So first we take a look at the bus. Uh, we need to define what's the range of voltage magnitude uh, for normal operation, for example. Typically uh, in a grid, I think it's around 0 0.9 to 1.1. So in that case, U min M will be 0 0.9 and then U M max will be 1.1. And uh, the next one is the voltage angle. There's a typo there. So we need to also put some limitation on how much uh, the angle, um, the range of the angle of, of each bus. So uh, capital theta mean uh, would be, for example, something like minus pi and uh, uh, capital theta max would be something like a pi. Um, and the next thing is to consider also some limitations on the bus ang angle difference. So if we have like, for example, two buses connected with, it, with each other, uh, one may want to uh, include some limitation on how much um, the, the differences, uh, the difference between those two angles uh, can be. And then also for the generator, it's rather straightforward. We have limitation for the active power and the active power. So this comes from probably the nameplate of the generator. Uh, in simple cases, sometimes we define as uh, the P mean, for example, or Q mean as zero. And in some more probably problems, uh, um, for example, in unit community problem, uh, uh, it's usually defined uh, more as a non-zero values. So they want to check whether uh, um, it's the the the, the values of the PG is fixable or not. Uh, next one is the branch. Um, so the branch is limited by the apparent power limit. In this case, uh, you can see the formulation as uh, the 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 sum of uh, square of the active power and the active power should be equal than the um, square of the um, apparent power specified for the branch. So usually this is also specified for transformer and uh, overhead lines. So another constraint that we need to consider is the power flow constraint. So I won't be explaining what it is because uh, with the equation you can find it yourself. Basically what uh, it says that, um, so if we have, also I need to mention that we assume the equivalent model for overhead lag. So this is a uh, physical representation of the e equivalent model. Uh, there, are, there are also some alternatives how to model, for example, uh, a short line or a very long line. But this is a sort of a typical one that uh, we want to take a look at. Um, so using this model, we have the some equality constraints coming from these uh, physical constraints. So we need to define also for both ways. So the one coming from uh, bus to bus I, 
and the one coming in, the one going from uh, bus I to bus J, and the one going from bus uh, J to bus I. And the formulation shall be provided. And what I want to uh, show is that uh, for this, using these formulations, then we have now something called nonlinear whole series because as you can see um, earlier probably we already saw that um, there are voltages for example these uh, voltages ui um, is a variable so we have a quadratic term of the voltage and also we have this term cosinus and sinus which are nonlinear. so um, if you already come here with um, different um, types of uh, optimization problems. You may already know that including some nonlinear constraints or some nonlinear objective function would make uh, the problem relatively difficult to solve because uh, we will have something that's called um, non-convexity. Uh, I want to explain it, but uh, with non-convex problems, um, the problems um, to solve the problem, there's no guarantee of getting optimal uh, global optimal solution. So you may end up in a local optimal solution um, um, compared to a complex problem. Um, but you can um, take a look at those terms uh, later uh, to understand more what they really mean. Um, so next um, is the nodal balance constraints and slack bus constraints. So first for the nodal balance constraints, um, what we want to take a look at this constraint is that for each node, we have uh, our balance. So this will, um, this is basically what the pitch of uh, current law um, imposes. So the power flow coming in, the sum of power flow coming in would be for to the sum of power flow coming out. So um, I define here um, power from generator as uh, coming into the bus and uh, the power going uh, from this bus to another bus and also the load um, to be coming out from the bus. So we have, we end up with this nodal balance constraints. Um, and also we need to uh, do this for First, the active power and also the reactive power. And lastly, is the slack bus constraint. Basically, this is just to provide a reference voltage in the system. So, usually we define the voltage angle as zero. So, we just need to decide which M would be acting as a slack. And then we define the voltage angle variable of this bus as zero. And lastly, after defining all of these uh, sets, variables, and constraints, uh, we need to decide uh, what we want to achieve from this model. So we need to define what the objective function will be. Uh, and for this tutorial, what we will be trying to solve is uh, optimal problem, an optimal possible problem, which tries to minimize total generation cost. So uh, mathematical notation from this would be um minimize some of the cg is the cost uh in a linear cost generation linear generation cost of generator g and then pg would be the uh, active power dispatch of this generator um, and in some problems the total cost function would not probably look as simple as this might be a polynomial function um, in some examples, um, typical examples for my triple for example, they already defined as a polynomial function, but what we'll be seeing later is uh, just using a simple linear generation cost function. And this is the summary of um, what we already defined. So, from the objective function, we have uh, to minimize total generation costs. 
and then subject to uh, fault bus voltage constraints, so the magnitude and then also the angle. And then we have also the limitation of between uh, two different connected buses. Next, we have this. So I will try to, okay, maybe you can see it better here. So these two are the limitation for the generators. We also already defined the, uh, the branch constraint. And then also we already defined some equality constraints for the power flow. And here we define also two other um, equality constraints for the nodal balance, both for active power and the reactive power. And lastly, uh, we may want to include this um, select bus constraint. So with this formulation, this is also something what is called as an ACOP formulation. Uh, what AC mean, what AC here means is that uh, we have a full a nonlinear AC power flow equations uh, for our this uh, inequality constraints, equality constraints, and also we include uh, parameters taking into account uh, reactive power flow in the system. So uh, this is something similar that probably that uh, you already solved using um, Newton Upton method in, 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 in just uh, nonlinear AC power nonlinear power flow equations. So uh, another note is that we need to remember again that this formulation uh, is nonlinear. Uh, this is due to uh, some quadratic constraints and also some nonlinear. Um, cosinus and sinus uh, functions in 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 the constraints. So next we go to something that's called DC optimal power flow formulation. So DC doesn't refer to uh, DC system. Uh, doesn't refer to direct current system like um, uh, what we. We are used to in power electronics, uh, perhaps, but this is more something that uh, refers to um, formulation, which linearizes linear, linearizes uh, the the formula the the original AC formulation that we have. So in order to end up with a linear optimization problem, we need to make some assumptions uh, for this formulation. So the first one is. Uh, the voltage magnitude UM that we saw already earlier at every node, we assume to be equal uh, one per unit. So, you know, also formulating this optimal powerful problem, what we uh, we will be working on per unit values, but I won't be discussing that for now. Um, also, the second assumption is that resistances or ohmic losses in our branches are also neglected. So there will be uh, no, we assume resistance to be zero. And also no reactive power flow considered in our problem. So we neglect all shunt reactive power contributions. For example, the one we saw in the uh, P Kefalin model of a line. And lastly, voltage angle differences across lines or branches are considered very small. This means that uh, the differences, the difference between, for example, theta i and theta j, would be approximately equal to zero. So we have, um, we can also approximate that the cosine cosine value of this difference and also will be equal to one, and then the sinus value of this um, voltage angle difference would be equal to zero. So we will eliminate this cosinus and sinus term in our formulation. And uh, nicely, uh, the, 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 now the power flow coming from branch B from bus I to J would be equal to minus, this is the susceptance of uh, the branch uh, multiplied by the, this whole, this different 
the difference uh, between um, voltage angle bus I and voltage angle bus G. So we take a look back at this AC optimal power formulation. Uh, we remove uh, some of these terms. We don't consider uh, reactive powers uh, coming from generator because we don't consider that in our system. We uh, have a different um, limitation for our branch. And this is, we completely uh, reformulate, um, replace these formulations with the DC power flow approximation. And also lastly, for the nodal power balance, we now neglect the reactive uh, power balance in a node. So to summarize the DC power, the DC optimal power flow formulation uh, would look like this. So we keep the objective function the same as the AC optimal power flow formulation. And now we have uh, relatively less constraints uh, than before. And then uh, we know that all of these constraints are linear. So we have this linear constraint, this nicely uh, linear uh, constraint, and also for the power flow constant, it's going to be taken care, taken care of this calculation. So that's it for the, for the two formulations. Uh, we have AC and DC optimal power flow formulations. So far, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so for my bachelor's thesis, I did some of the analysis of the system. One of them was that if you want to define an objective function, let's say you have two important points. The first, let's say one of them, how do you define an objective function based on that? Do you find that one objective function, or can you do a nested objective function, or can you? You have to put one in the constraints. How Good question. Uh, so there's only one objective function, right? So you just need to add another term that represents, for example, your CO2 cost. In some problems, they also include CO2 cost, for example. And then it should be based on one of your variables, right? So in this case, we can reuse again uh, variable PG. Now, uh, before we have, uh, for example, this cost, PG, just this is the fuel cost. Now we can add, uh, for example, now the CO2 cost. That would be for each unit of your uh, generate active power dispatch. So you can just add them there. Um, there's nothing nested. So I can consider. Um, Always define one objective function that we can now pass the other one. Yeah. There are also, um, there's another type of optimization problem which, which has uh, multi objective functions, but it's a uh, rather different case in some way. But I think the simplest approach to take into account that cost you can just add them in your objective function and it will take care of your total generation cost right because you know in the end that will be your total generation cost and then the problem will uh, consider that you have a variable also to represent how much uh, that co2 cost uh, is represented in your total generation cost and this um, I have a question about the model that you use for the computation model. You mentioned you use bi model. Um, yeah. So, is this also the, the computability routine model or some other kind of model is going to be the same that you just explained? Um, P model, it's just a dual of the, the P model, right? You can Example. You can build a P model from T equivalent model, right? But I mean, if you have uh, the um, equations, you can 
uh, include whatever are different models in the, in your in the, I mean, constraints mm -hmm. um, in the constraints. Um, yeah. So and does the modeling that you develop your system impact when you find the final solution for your optic problem? Did you uh, say that again? So that the model that you use for the network does that like the accuracy of the model, how we model the system, like lines and so does that impact the solution of your OPM or if you find a solution? It is uh, definitely it is expected to uh, influence the solutions because for example, if you have like different set of equations representing like this, some physical constraints, you will basically change your visible sets. Uh, so maybe with this uh, the previous constraints, the visible set will be in this area. But now, probably if you have different models or different equations, you may have this sort of constraint, and then probably something like this. And then you have different visible sets. So probably your optimal solution won't be here anymore, but it will be here if you can find it. So indeed, if you change those constraints, of course, it will perhaps change also like the optimal decisions. I think that's in general, we find all of your modeling, but also in the model of the section that they will find the variation of the voltage from one part to the other with a piece of hospital. I think that each element is going to be able to input another representation like the R or the R or the C value. That's the idea. In the hospital, I'm not expecting the C value to be more than the R or the yeah, there should be trade offs. Um, but then, I mean, you need to also to consider those equations whether it will change completely your optimization problem or not. You, it can go from, you know, linear to maybe quadratic to a very nonlinear problem. And of course, you want to take that into account. For example, if you go for a very complex uh, equation, then and the problem tends to be really hard to solve, and then probably you you won't really get a chance to see what the optimal optimal decision would look like, and then probably you lose some uh, sensitivities of behavior there if you run your model. So, uh, I mean, I read one time that every model is basically wrong, but some are useful. So that's also a good point where to start. You know, you know that you do some approximation for your model, but you also need to understand what you really want to achieve. Maybe having like, for example, this AC optimal model is not necessary for your uh, market problem. So you need to take into account those things. And for, for these constraints that you define, let's say you have some for those, uh, your objective function, let's say your OPF solves the problem, does it find the closest answer towards the uh, end of the inequality, or is it, uh, does it matter? So it depends on the feasible set that you have. Also depends on what sort of solver that you're using, because in the end, um, practically speaking, uh, you define this in your code thread, uh, and then you just submit it to a solver. Probably you don't know what's going on behind. Uh, there are some dedicated solvers to solve certain uh, certain problems. For example, you may see this as a, just like a linear problem. So you can assume this is convex. So using a certain algorithm, for example, like a simplex method, you're guaranteed to get optimal solution. And then it always be, uh, you will always be able to get those optimal or global optimal solutions. But if you have sort of like a nonlinear problem, maybe uh, in 2D it looks like this. 
we use some algorithm to search through the space. Uh, but using your settings of your solvers and the way the solver, the solver works, you may end up just here probably is like your, your optimal solution. But this is a local because somewhere here there's actually more optimal solution. Um, so you can think of this like an AC power flow problem. All right, you use a solver that uses something called interior point method that uh, I will show later. Um, the way it works, you want to try to find every uh, local optimal solution. But due to some settings, some converges, it will stop at some point, maybe here. And then after it finishes it, the algorithm it it always says actually uh, they found a local optimum solution. Even if they may end up here, they they say that it's a local optimum solution because they cannot guarantee. They they don't check. Could be, but could be this is the global optimum solution, but there's no guarantee of that. That's the problem with uh, non-complexity. You cannot guarantee that. You end up in a global optimum solution. So you end up defining an algorithm that goes and checks again the country is that's global optimum or not. Yeah. In the one complex problem. From what I heard from uh, people from operation research, they're still trying to find a way to do that because I mean for a simple problem, you probably end up in a um, in an actually global optimum solution. But in the end, um, you, have, you will in, upscale your model, then you cannot ever check that. And then the algorithm cannot guarantee that. That's a problem or the guarantee of the, algori the algorithm. Um, some people are working on that um, somewhere in the operation research lab or in mathematics lab. Um, but it's a very interesting discussion, actually. A lot of research on that, how to solve, uh, how to get a global optimal solution from a nonlinear problem. Um, okay, any more questions? Maybe from the formulations or something's not clear, something is incorrect, maybe? Yeah. Or... Simulation. Yeah, I think it's um, the one when you say the formula, and then the here because theta i minus the three becomes theta i minus the energy. Like this. Ah, yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah, it's, it's correct. It should be theta i. That's why. Uh, it becomes this formulation coming from like the, the previous easy formulation. And it should be, it should be um, at the I minus the G. Uh, nice sketch. So if not, then it will be zero. Yeah. Next to All right. So what time is it now? So the next thing that I want to do is to explain how we can implement this formulation in Julia. Trying to think of oh, what's the best way to do this, but in the end I end up with, you know, just showing you how it works um, using an ID, in this case, the Visual Studio Code. I'm not sure whether any of you um, has already downloaded um, some files there. But if you want to try it with me, you can just uh, follow what I'm doing. Here. So, so the formulation is one thing, and the implementation implementation is another thing. And I think I'll just try to specific. You know, just duplicate. Yeah. 
So if you already downloaded uh, all the files in the repository, you will have all of these files, I presume. Uh, if you are having difficulty, let me know, but only if you want to try to uh, do this with me. Um, so, so if you, if you saw a reminder, the reminder sent on Friday, uh, and then you want to follow this um, um, tutorial, uh, I expect that you already installed ESO Studio Code and installed Julia in the computer, on your computer, and then also already install some packages. Um, so if, now if, you, if you're already there, what I want you to do is to open the main file, main.gl file. So this main.gl file contains um, all the necessary Codes that you need to run the optimal power flow. Um, and also, there are some other files, for example, this uh, init model. There's also this build DC OPF. There's also this build AC OPF. Um, so I will explain it one by one. So for the init model, uh, this also is one of the trickiest things to do before implementing your optimization problem. So basically what this function does is to obtain all the necessary uh, information from your system. So it will import a grid data, it will define the time steps, and then also it can um, import some time series uh, information, for example, for the load. And for the other file, uh, this contains a function to build your DC optimal power flow problem. Uh, so as you can see, it will, this, this file will define, uh, this function will define the variables, uh, the constraints, and also the objective function. And also another file uh, to build uh, AC OPF formulation. Um, so just something about this tutorial about Julia. So if you already have Julia installed in your in your Visual Studio code, you can just open Julia terminal by pressing alternate J O. And it should open the Julia terminal. So you press alternate and then you press J O sequentially. So not together, but sequentially. Are you able to do that? Or you can also run any line in your Julia file. For example, you can select one of the lines and then press control enter, and then it will open also um, Julia. Uh, terminal, Julia repo. Has anyone succeeded to do this? Would be nice if someone is able to do that. Uh, so here's the tricky thing. Uh, we need to know where to start, right? So luckily, there's already, it's already been some work on uh, let's say med power to define how a power system uh, um, can be can be represented. So I'm going to open this med file. Is any does anyone is anyone familiar with a med power m file? So this m power m file is basically. Uh, a MATLAB file, it contains um, sort of the information of your system. So from, for example, BAS data, it has um, distinct structure, how to define these uh, the parameters for, of the system. So this is, we have BAS data and then it will define in a 
matrix um, and a vector what uh, parameters from each bus uh, is. For example, for the bus data, we have PD, which means that the active power of the demand, and then QD, reactive power of the demand, and G is for the susceptance, uh, the, sorry, con the conductance of the, the shunt conductance of the bus, and then BS is the uh, shunt susceptance of the conductance. So those parameters, we will need them to formulate our optimal power flow problem. Sorry? So, uh, for now, I think this is one of the most practical things to do to um, import uh, typical IEEE systems or typical power grid uh, systems because um, sort of like a, the community decided to do so. You can, in fact, define your own uh, file structure even, and then you write your own code how to import that file and then how to utilize them later. But uh, this is sort of, um, I would say, consensus um, because in some packages, in some known packages, for example, like power models, they also use a sort of file structure uh, uh, because there's been a lot of uh, database also on this um, typical power system um, data. So prob I think they, they want to keep using that data. And then this, um, this data comes from uh, Mat power uh, or MATLAB file. So, on top of bus data, you have also data for your generator, data for your uh, generator cost, and also data for your branch. Um, I'm not sure whether, I don't think we have enough time to also understand how this really works, but if you find on the internet, for example, a uh, MatPower is file, you, you can try to understand how uh, this data is built. Um, but what I want you to do, or I want us to do now, is just uh, try to use this file first, and then using some packages to then parse them into our uh, local Julia variables. So we will use, uh, for example, tab data of dictionary to collect those, uh, to collect that information in our system, in our uh, Julia environment. Um, so I have already a working file here. Um, so we know that, okay, uh, this is the name of the file, and then we'll try to import, import this data in Julia uh, to convert them into a Julia uh, data type. So luckily um, in Julia, there's a package called Power Models. So this is also uh, a package that you can use to run an optimal power flow problem. Um, basically, you can just, for example, send this file, uh, import this file, and then use the function um, to, 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 to run an op optimal power flow. And it comes also in different um, formulations. Uh, but also there's another function that is useful uh, from this um, package. So I define PM as um, package power model. So if I want to use um, this function of parsing this MATPOWER MATLAB file, I can just use that and then um, uh, put the, put, Put the name of my of the file that I want to import. So, for example, um, to, I'm running parse mat power. So, what we saw earlier in in this structure, now um, it becomes um, a dictionary. So, diction dictionary is a um, key value pair data type in Julia, where you can define. A key, for example, in this case, bus, and then it will contain 
some values uh, in it um, if once you call, call it. So we can check uh, what the data, uh, what the structure looks like now. So we have now, we define them. After we import them, we, we, we define them as case data. So in this case data, we already have set of information of all the parameters that we need. So for example, uh, if we compare to this, if we have like bus four, we know that, oh, sorry, this generator, if we have a bus four, this bus ID, we know that uh, the PD of this bus will uh, be equal to 400 megawatts, but also to mention the units. Uh, but then uh, once you import them using a parse math power function of power models, it will be converted into per unit value. So in this um, math file, it's also defined uh, the base uh, MVA, uh, which is 100 MVA in this case. So in per unit, this uh, active power of the demand connected to bus 4 will be equal to 4. So this is also what we will see uh, after we parse them. And here we check, for example, bus 4. We have, um, because it's a lot, uh, sorry, I forgot that it's not defined in the bus. It will be automatically defined in the load. So if we open load 4, um, sorry. So there are only three loads here. And the way the parse math power works is, is that uh, it will recalculate, re-index again the load. So this will be load one, this will be load two, this will be load three. So if we check load three, uh, we know that the PD would be equal to four, um, which was converted uh, using a base MVA before. And also for the KD, we have now uh, the value in the per unit. So using just this parse math power function, we already obtain a very nice structure to work with uh, for our uh, formulation. So we can just, for example, easily call them here, case data, for example, bus. We get all the information of each bus, bus four, bus I, uh, bus one, bus five, bus two, and bus three. The same also for the other components. Um, so far, do you have any questions? There's a lot of information here, so I'm trying to also to be clear about it. But I guess once you try it yourself, uh, things will get much clearer. Um, because you can find some information also how uh, this data structure works and also how Julia works if you don't have any experience there. Um, so yeah. Now we have the a base to build our formulation. So we have all the parameters uh, enclosed in this case data. Uh, but also uh, another thing to, to consider is that uh, for this model, I take into account if we want to simulate it for a time series. So I also want to consider, for example, I mentioned earlier that the load will um, act as parameters instead of uh, variables. So I need to also get uh, these values. Um, so this this is probably not the most uh, convenient way to do it, but I prepare some Excel file that contains time series of um, our load. So what you see here is just a very simple Excel file. So what it really says is that I have two sheets now. So sheet PD and sheet uh, UD. And in PD, I have on the top row uh, the um, bus ID. So for bus ones, uh, for time series one. So because this is the first uh, time, um, the first time time step, uh, the PD will be equal to three per unit and the same for the rest. And the, for KD as well, uh, we have uh, these values. I match this with uh, the load imported with the with the parse math power. 
So as you can see now for Kitty for load three, which is connected to bus four, uh, the Kitty is equal to 1.31. Uh, so now we also import this. Uh, now we just we define the file. Uh, but to also get all of these parameters into our model, uh, we need to initiate the model. So uh, the question might be now how we are going to formulate uh, our optimal power flow problem. So you may think that how we can, for example, uh, recognize, let's say, this equation as a constraint. Also, this equation as constraints, this objective function as a constraint. So we need to work with a sort of framework to be able to define this objective function, these constraints, and also um, the, the variables that we have. So in Julia, why it's convenient as well, in Julia, we have jump package. So jump package is basically um, mathematical optimization package for Julia. Um, you can find a lot of information there. Uh, for example, if you find jump Julia, uh, here you can see that uh, this is a modeling language for math mathematical optimization. So this is how we are going to build our optimal power flow formulations. So we are going to assign our constraints and our variables and also the objective function of our problem. Uh, so in this unit init model function, going back again to our uh, param our model parameters, um, we are going to already use uh, a model, this Julia model, um, to obtain these parameters. <clears throat> So what the first thing that we need to do is first to define uh, a jump model. So the way you do it is just you, you just define model. In this case, I already defined uh, the solver. I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but uh, um, just for simplicity, this is how you define a model. You can also define it as an empty model like this. If you run it, then you have this MDCOPIA, for example, if you're going to build DCOPIA powerful formulation, you will get uh, this, you'll be returned with this jump model. So now it has, you can see already from the terminal, it has zero variables uh, and there's no optimizer attached to it. But if we do, did it as before, now you already have a sulfur name uh, attached to that. And just a um, simplicity, we can go straight away to the init model function. So this is a function where we will pass a jump model, a grid data, in this case, uh, the one that we imported from uh, the, mat, the MATLAB file that we used earlier for, for our system. And then here I'm just adding time steps. So how many times that steps we consider here. And again, for simplicity, uh, later we will just define it as one. And also we already define where uh, where is the file containing our load time series. So we can just import them later. So, um, yeah. Um, where do I start? So, as explained earlier in this uh, session, we already I already explained that okay we need to define some sets first in order to make uh, some generalization how we denote uh, our power system components. Uh, so uh, what we can do here, also what I'm using, what I think it's practical to use, uh, is to attach all these sets and basically later also all the parameters into our model. So we have now MDCOPF as our model. You can see here, this is a model, this is an empty model. 
but we can attach an external information to it. This is just a convenient way um, to, for example, later uh, call again specific constraint or specific objective function uh, variables in our in our model. So that's why in init model, you can see now. Okay, um, we define M as um, as an argu argument for our model. So this will be a model, a jump model. So we want to attach some information there now, right? And then we add a dictionary um, to contain our set. So the way to do that, we can just write something like this. So if you pass a previously defined model MDCOPF to our function init model, it will define later this set. So basically what the function will do is something like this. So I'm just writing it in the terminal. Um, so ext, we can define sets as a dictionary. So there's an empty dictionary there. Uh, this is just a convenient way to do, um, again, to do uh, how we can easily recall again um, some of the information in our model. But I'm doing it right now in the terminal, but if you run the fu this function, it will do so. So we, we define all of the sets we need um, in our, in our model, so from the time steps, bus, some generator and branch, um, also some uh, arcs uh, of um, branches that I talked earlier in, in, in this tutorial. Uh, it's a bit, it's quite a lot to explain actually, but I suggest you to take a look at this later. Um, but basically, I ran some different function in order later uh, to get all of this value. So I'll just run it and then show how it looks like. So if you run this init model, um, so first I need to run the uh, file in order to run the function. You can also run it from here. Um, so now we already have um, init model defined as a function. So we can just run this function in model and then pass all the necessary arguments, which means that the already defined model before. So because it asks us to pass this model and then also the grid data, which is uh, coming from this case data, coming from the med file. And then also we need to pass the time step, which means that we need to define a sort of integer. If it's one, then there will be only one time step. And also we need to define, uh, this is a uh, text of string, uh, the, the, where the load time series file is located. So we need to define where it is. So it's located here, and then we will uh, import information from that file. So if we run this, it may be, um, maybe it will take, oh. Yeah, I need to close the Excel file because you cannot read the file if I open it. So maybe just to restart again. So now oh, we have nothing in our model. So if we, for example, on DCOPF, we try to find external value of, for example, sets, we won't have anything because we, we haven't run this function in order to pass all of the information and parameters from our, to our model from the data. So now if we run this init model, basically we, we are passing all of the parameters and also the set um, information to our external, uh, our external part of our model. We can check that now the, um, the set, for example, take a look at set here, Will be already defined. So we have them defined as a dictionary because uh, it's done this way. So now we have already this information information attached to our model. Again, this is a a convenient way to do it. There are uh, probably hundreds or 
different ways to do to, to do this but this is uh what uh what i think is convenient to start with so whenever you want to access for example what's the set of uh for example the buses uh you can just call this again and then it will return you all the uh, bus ids in your system so using this you already have it in your model so this is convenient because it's stored in your in your model and then uh, from that now we can start uh, uh, writing our formulation so um, when we formulate this we we define a function again where we pass just our model this is where it's convenient so we don't need again to pass uh, the other, the other information like the grid data, the load time series, because they are all attached already to our model. And then to build our formulation, we can just pass um, our model. So uh, keep in mind that this M is not the same as, um, because this is a function, this is just a, a convenient way to write it. Um, but we will pass MDC OPF later to, to this um, function. So we, we have it this now. We can see that there's zero variables here now. Uh, and we will try to add some of those variables and then also um, constraints and then the objective function to our model. Um, just probably if you want to check, okay, you, you can already try to solve this model, for example, by just running optimize and then choose the model and then it will um, give you objective value usually zero or error because there's nothing bound so it's invisible um, so that's why we need to define constraints or objective function and variables to make the problem feasible to solve um, i'm using a lot of mathematical terms here but uh, i think once you once you uh, get used to building this sort of uh, formulation you will understand better what what they really mean so uh just now we are moving on to how to build the dcopf so we define this function build dcopf and uh, since we already attach this information in our model we can just recall them again and then define them as a as just a variable within the function so for example in order to not rewrite the sets again as m.ext set gen, we can just define them as g, and then we can reuse uh, these variable letters to define our, our formulation. So let's assume that we know all the parameters. We have all the parameters. We know all the sets. Uh, we, know all the, we know all the time series already there. Uh, you can check them later how they are defined. Uh, so let's take a look how uh, jump model works. So how we can define variables uh, for our optimization problem, how we can define constraints and also the objective function. So again, we use a similar way as before here uh, to define variables. We prepare first uh, an empty dictionary. This is just how I do it. So again, we want to attach these variables into external uh variables of our model so we define again m.ext so later we expect we will expect them to be here later uh, once we run the function so then we can always uh, call them later if we define it this way and the way we write um so if you want to define um variables for the generators and specifically for, for example, now we have to define the active power of this generator, we can write it this way. So you can see that uh, So if we want to add variable to our model, what we can write that so we can just add variable. And we need to pass our model. In this function, it's called M, but actually what we will use in the MDC of here. And then also, uh, it's quite a thing, but 
what basically means is that this variable will represent uh, this set. So think about it like this. So if we have PG, if we want to define PG, it will be something like PGP. So this is for all P in G and for all uh, P in G. So this is the time step, this is the generated. So if you write it this way, uh, this variable will be defined for all generators, which is already defined in this set for all time set, which is already defined in this uh, time um, set of T. And then what you can do with with by adding this variable is that you can just you know put the name on that as what's written um in the in this code uh another thing that you can do actually uh you can already define for example yeah uh, an upper bound and a lower bound for this variable so if you for example have um this pg starts from yeah this pg T mean is PG max. So you can already define this as, for example, for the lower bound, you can just write lower bound. Then you call it somewhere. If you already uh, define uh, a dictionary to in order to call this, you can rewrite this as um, G equals to G. And then the lower bound would be, um, you can just write it as, for example, this is your dictionary for your P min. So J P min G. If you write it this way, this constraint for the lower bound will be already defined when you add these variables. So it's it's a uh, it's one nice way to do it, but again it's uh, quite complicated also to explain if you haven't had any experience with this. Uh, but just yeah, for other components you'll do the same. So you add variable, you add variable, you use uh, these sets. So for example, yeah, this we can write it as G equals to g so this will be um, the the set we can define it this way and then we can for example lower bound equals to now we have gen p min you can just define it that gen p min g so you can do it this way so this will be the same as if you have you don't have this lower bound plus if you define this uh, constraints and i'll talk about the constraint now i'm just going to return it but before going to the objective function uh, i'll speak about the constraints first so the way we also define set of constraints we need also something to contain them in this case dictionary so, for example, this is a simple one for maximum and minimum active power limits for this generator. Again, we use this structure and then we define a new key of this constraint. So this means that gen p max upper bound. So, um, oh, this should be a lower bound thing. This should be upper bound. And for the lower bound, we have this gen p min g uh, less than equal or gen p gt. This is basically the same as what we have here, the first term without the P max. And the second one is the same as the one on the right side. So again, to add constraint, uh, we just need to change. Uh, before we do it as add variable, now we have it as eight constraint. So this is, um, this is how you add a constraint to your system. And, and, and 
as before, you can always define each index in G as something, for example, this G. So, and then you use this, what it'll, it will do is that it will define all the constraints for each G. You see that we have one line, but using this uh, index G equals to G, is it G equals to G or T equals to T, it will be the the constraints will be defined for each index of, of this set. So um, the same thing is uh, is done for also active branch active power limits of the branches. Uh, we have this PBAC to represent the power flowing through branch P. Uh, and then the index is defined from the arc. So uh, we have this tuple of branch I and J in arcs as we defined before uh, for the sets. So just to make you familiar again, it's basically this. So we define this set uh, and then we create constraints for each uh, BRIG in arcs. So why we need to do that? Um, because for example, if we just define it for each branch, uh, we need we don't know like which which um, which IJ which bus I and bus J uh, the branch connects to, and then and also if if also there are multiple branches in between those buses, we need to know exactly which branch um, connects the two um, we, we are we're calculating. So for the active branch power limits, it's basically limiting the PBIG between them because it can go in both directions, coming in and coming out or from IG to GI. Um, we have a negative of the Pmax on the lower bound and then positive Pmax on the upper bound. So this is what uh, we're writing. And for the bus angle limits, um, in a similar way, uh, just to keep it short, I'll continue for the next constraint. Uh, for the slacks bus, we already have a set of select buses, so we're sure that this will contain just one. We defined it before, you can check it yourself uh, later. And then we define that this variable bus angle will equal to zero. Um, for the power flow constraint, since we are using uh, DC approximation. Um, I'm writing this DC power flow because if you extend it to have like a DC system, you can write it a DC power flow with DC approximation. But this is just like for the AC components. So the way uh, you define the constraints, it's the same. You add constraint, pass the model, and then define the set and the indexes. And then you write the equation. So this PBAC. BRIGT. So what I'm writing here without T, so you can think of every variable has T or time defined in it. So this is just, this is basically what we're calculating here. And the last constraint, last equality constraint, um, we have the nodal balance uh, for our network. So what this basically does is that, uh, again, we sum all the generation, active power generation coming into the bus, and then we distract them with um, the load and then also the power flowing out from the, the bus, uh, and then they should be equal to zero. So this is how you um, define constraints and variables using jump. And finally, coming back here, we have the objective function. In a similar way, we can just attach again to the model, the objective, and we can just, uh, for the objective function, we need to specify whether the objective is to minimize or maximize. 
um, sounds is ready. Okay. So, in a similar way, you want to get a circuit. You pass again the model, but after this, you need to pass an argument for the minimization or optimization problem. How much? Because for which one. And then you define uh, the equation straight away. Um, so you sum all of the, basically what this does is that you sum all of the generation costs uh, for all generators and for all the time steps. Once you're sure whether the model is uh, correct or not, or not, you can also just run this file. And then this will define this field DC OPF. And uh, if we run the function, it should work. Now we have, it returns the details of the model. So, you can see that um, now before we had all the zero variables, but by you know um, writing those equations in the function, dividing constraints and variables, we have um, some addition to the model. So now we have twenty two variables, uh, an objective function. It also explains what sort of objective function that we have. So it's written as f x which means that a fine expression, a linear expression. Uh, and then also uh, it says how many equality functions that we have. So we have here 18 a fine expression of equality functions, which means that they are linear. And also uh, next to them, it says that we have um, 58 um, Inequality functions, which are also um, linear. So we know for sure that we have a linear problem because our objective function and our constraints are linear. And we we already attach solver to do this because you have a feasible set now, but you need an algorithm to search through those that space to find an optimal solution. And the software that I'm using now is IPOPT. Um, it is an interior um, point method, um, typically used for a nonlinear program, uh, but it can also be applicable for a linear program um, because of, we have this convexity coming from our linear program using this algorithm, although it will say later that the solution is locally optimum, we can sort of trust that the solution will be the global optimum one. So we now have this jump model very nicely built. And in order to optimize or to solve this uh, linear program, we can just use function optimize. This comes from Jump. So if you run this uh, optimized because it's such a small problem, you can, um, uh, it, it runs for less than a second. Um, so um, it's already run, but we need to find some information about this, um, about this model. So one thing that we can do is that we can also Try to find to get to know the solution summary of this model. So if you run this, it will tell. Sorry, maybe we haven't built the model yet. Optimized. Okay. Um, can optimize again. So once we run this, so the, in the terminal, you can see now the iteration coming from the solver. And it says that, okay, uh, they went through 14 iterations 
and then the exit message is optimal solution found, although it's still locally optimal, see? And then we can obtain some solution summary from this problem. So you can see um, it shows um, some details from our watch to the software that we're using to see the map and blocks. And again, you can see that the termination, termination status is locally solved because we are using a lot of optimal solution. And what we really need to see for this one is that. Okay, how do we check the values? And so, how much the total generation cost that we have from the system? So, um, it says here, but also we can also we can get it from this function objective value if you run it. So we get now that the total generation cost is equal to seventeen thousand four hundred seventy nine, whatever dollar euro per um, per per year. So that's per per unit. So if you want to convert it, not per thing. So seventeen thousand four hundred seventy-nine euro per unit. So if obtained in megawatt euro, for example, if it's in euro, you need to multiply it by hundred. Um, so after Writing this formulation, maybe another interesting to do is to compare it with um, with uh, already um, known package or already validated package. And in this case, it is power models. So to run this same exact system and parameters, we we can just use the same case file. And then use the function of solve DCOPF from our models in order to run a, to solve the problem. So if we just run this um, line of codes, you can probably do it also yourself. It will parse the file, uh, parse the case file, and then uh, it will apply DC optimal power flow problem. Then it will uh, show the summary of the problem uh, in in the dic in the form of dictionary. So what you see here, uh, we want to check whether the objective value is the same uh, as the one that we as the model that we wrote ourselves, just to make sure that we didn't have any mistakes in the previous model. So. From the power models, we have objective function of 17,479.9. And then if we take a look at the at our own model, we check the objective value. It refers to approximately the same value. So because just it 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 shows more um, decimals at the back. And then probably we can just print out print them out together. So they are Pretty much the same. So we then can sort of believe that um, the, the formulation that we write ourselves sort of for uh, sort of validated. Why don't we have to invest so much? Um, I have the same because I have the same problem. I wrote uh, some addition here, yeah. and I don't have the same. Uh, I don't manage to validate it hundred percent with the uh, other models. But I wonder why because as we see, I don't understand why we don't have exactly the same. Is there like a constraint we are missing? I also have. Similar experience. They are not exactly exactly the same until we realize decimals because. Um, but here I didn't see exactly that. So the difference. The difference starts from um, seven, nine, eight decimal. So that's very small, right? 
and I can think that I would like to believe that the, the difference comes from the fact that I mean the problem is not exactly the same because sometimes um, I'm not because I'm not really sure what how how the the power models uh, processes all the parameters uh, at the bank could be some losses of decimals. Uh, could be some more constraints, could be some, some different ways uh, to represent constraints. Because I also notice if you write constraints differently, uh, for example, less. Let me just, for example, I'm not, uh, yeah, I've never been really sure, but for example, this can be just one constraint if you just put uh, Gen P max, something like this. Oops. So you don't have to write them in two separate constraints. But in jump, uh, these two things can be different. Mm. There's like a some sort of I think behind uh, the background process where they uh, calculate uh, the parameters. Uh, and also how they represent it. So I'm not sure why there's like a very small difference. If if it's relatively huge, for uh, example, maybe one, even one, two percent, then you should probably try again to uh, take a look again at, at your formulation. Maybe there's something wrong. But this is a very, very small difference. And in your experience, how, how much was? I remember it's like I went into one point and I had some some like triple um, networks where it worked, had exact the exact same mm -hmm. results, and some of the triple uh, networks where I had a difference. Okay. But I. I, I but is it huge? Like, what's the magnitude? I remember it. It was not huge, but it, it was it was not the same. But I will try to find again, maybe try with your codes mm -hmm. and it works that on my side and not working. See there it works. Mm -hmm. Because there it's just a problem on my side relation. There's another thing as well because um, I just found it actually uh, earlier today that um for example, if I run another case, 24 bus case, um, it, it gives different results uh, from, uh, from if I run power models, if I run this model, because uh, one thing also that I noticed that I'm using just a linear cost model, right? But if you run power models, I think it automatically detects whether you have a Polynomial yeah, cost function. It works for it has zero. zero terms. Sorry. Um, when I did the comparison, I only selected the the IEEE cases that had linear. Ah, okay. Uh, linear cost function. So yeah. That would not be. Okay. And it's usually very something very very small and. Quite unseen, also happens to me all the time when I'm working on a model. Somehow, you know, it's just like a slight mistake or slight error. But also sometimes it's not completely uh, a mistake because sometimes in uh, all the pack, some packages, there's also some error that you can find uh, in some formulation. There's some error in in power models that you can probably find. Some physical constraint that you interpret differently, perhaps. Uh, but if you're really sure that they are the same constraints, you compare both of them side to side that they are the same, and it still gives a different result. Then, uh, yeah, it's hard to find find the error. Any more questions? And giving a tutorial, and it is tough, especially if we don't 
have 10 minutes. You have a lot of things to present. And maybe next time it's better if you just focus on one thing and use a very simple case case. I have a question about the concept of high colors and the factors themselves. Like if you see that you have to install it, then it's all the same. Yeah. So in the reminder, I uh, already. Uh, include some information on how to add the packages. So in your case, you have already added all of all the packages. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's something probably also with the environment. You need to set up the package packages in, in the correct in the correct environment. So not in the environment. But Um, I actually have another example for the AC optimal power flow, but you can try to take a look at it yourself. It's already verified also for case five. Uh, you can try to run it and then take a look how the formulations are written. Uh, so they're basically by the same, but just like with more constraints, uh, more more equations, uh, more variables in that. And then also there's a nice file where you can export uh, res two results from your DCOPF where you can see the plot of the, 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 the branch flow and then the generator. But actually I can also show it here. So if you run this code, um, something like that. In results DCOPF. You can see uh, what the decisions look like. So we have only one time set. So I'm following this active power dispatches from all the generators. And so you can see that here you know from this result that generator four uh, is not activated. Uh, you can see that. Uh, which one is generator for? So it's this generator. And then uh, you may ask why, maybe because the cost is very high. We can also verify that. That's how you check this thing. So in the init model, we have the gen and cost linear. So if we write it here, It on the terminal. Yeah, we know that generator four is the the most expensive generator. Makes sense that uh, there's no active power dispatch coming from the generator. While for generator five, it is cheaper to put out it. Uh, per unit. Then it gets to dispatch uh, volume. A full capacity. Then you can also check yourself. Um, for the branch, I can also show the result. So this is for the branch. So uh, take a look at branch four. Coming from the bus two to bus three. So it flows the opposite direction. So it takes that it goes from bus three to bus two. And we know how much megawatt um, flowing through that branch. And the same also for, for all the other branches. Yes, you can try to run this code and then you know change some parameters and then check the results yourself. Okay, are there any more questions? Has anyone managed to run something? Mm. Are you able to run? Yeah. I also have some errors, but... Yeah. 
So very badly designed to you have some load that can generate generate from the port and you have to make it with like some most expensive stuff. So you still need some money because you have the loss of the line. Yeah. yeah. Good point because in DC you have people power flow, you don't consider the loss. So, so that's why uh, decisions end up like that. It would be a different story probably if you have um, AC open bubble formulation, not just probably the limitation coming from the probably you don't want to have so many so much so many losses. Probably also there's a limitation uh, of transferring power from one bus to another bus because you have more constraints on that. So yeah, uh, that's running sure so um, and let's see how how, how different they are. Um, I'll try to also, uh, if I have more time, to update the repository and I'll probably put some more explanation on how we can set it up. Probably it helps for it helps people with our prior knowledge with Julia. And if it's, it's a simple one, um, um, yeah. I'm well, personally, I cannot really comment on that because I didn't use other programming languages that extensive, and I also probably I didn't use full capacity of Julia. So for me, it's fine, but there are a lot of reports that say Julia is much faster and much greener as well. Because it requires less comp computational uh, power. Uh, I sort of also just believe that uh, report. At least also, I'm, I'm feeling comfortable using this because probably there's a nice feature ahead and the community is growing. So that's why. Yeah, I just are more friendly than other. So, uh, Compared to MATLAB, uh, it's easier to. Uh, I like the data type structure better in Julia than in MATLAB, for example, because MATLAB doesn't really have like data type like dictionary, so it's hard to access some information. You have to use. I, I forget what it's called. Mm -hmm. No, I can I cannot remember There's something similar with dictionary, but it's a bit tricky to access information from that uh, that uh, uh, With Python, don't really have <laughs> enough experience to call them. Uh, I can only suggest to use Julia. <laughs> That's why also I was thinking to, to you know to try to have a workshop. Probably for some other one that is to get that If there are no more questions, we can just conclude. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.